I'm Marielle Boucault. I'm working at the French Ministry of Health. I will uh, be your master of ceremony today. I'm also a project officer on IMR, and I was privileged enough to work in the EU Jamrai for the last year. Please, uh, to start with, uh, I'm going to remind you that you can follow us on Twitter and use some hashtag like hashtag EU Jamrai Conference and hashtag Keep Antibiotics Working. I'm very impressed by the prestigious panel that we got yesterday and today coming from all over Europe, especially during those very special times. But first, I'm delighted to welcome Christine Berlin, Head of International and European Affairs at the French Ministry of Health, who was also involved in sustainability issues at the EU Jamrai. Christine, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Maria. Thank you, and, and good morning to all. Um, um, I don't know if you can hear me here. Um, so it's my privilege I'm going to open this second day of this final conference of Jamrai, um, and and really delighted to open this. We have had them I in yesterday a very enlightening journey through some of the key achievements of Shanghai, and I found of particular interest um, the, the concrete best practices piloted during the joint action. And most of all, the uh, European AMR, I mean, communities that, that has been built, I mean, through the exchange and country business. Uh, this community of dedicated professionals is leading change in infection prevention and control and antibiotics stewardship. Um, it's a community of action and it represents really a key European asset and, and should really continue to, to be supported after Jamrai stops. We, uh, Jamrai has also explored I mean, some European strategies to incentivize public and private research and innovation on alternative solutions to antibiotic and strategies um, to take your sustainable I mean, access to important antibiotics across. Europe. This is what we're going to hear today. <clears throat> and this is important in part of the all the sustainability issues that we have been dealt with I mean, during the Shanghai as well. Uh, just to I mean, I, I will, will conclude very short introduction. Um, and I want to recall that the current crisis has brought into sharp relief the need to understand the complexity of the drivers of human health. Um, consequence of our increasingly fractured relationship with the environment calls for a one else approach and collaboration across countries to address the multiple risks, reach capacity at global level for surveillance and direct preventative control measures. The European Commission has put the table an ambitious package to address it across all its programs. Just to mention a few with um, Farm to Fork, EU for Health, European Pharmaceutical Strategy, Digital Era. I'm really confident with this ambitious package on the table that we could collectively reach and take up the challenge. Thank you very much. <coughs> Please to give the floor back to Marielle and I wish you a very fruitful conference. Many thanks, Christine. So just to give you an overview, today from 9 to around 10.30, we're going to talk about antimicrobial stewardship, so the appropriate use of antimicrobials and antibiotics in animal and human health. And then we're going to talk about infection and prevention, uh, infection prevention and control programs. We're going to have a short break, and then we're going to talk about research and innovation. But first, let me welcome Marie Molvik and Oliver Kasselnik from the Institute of Public Health of Norway. They both have been involved in the Work Package 7 on appropriate use and of antimicrobial in human and animal health. Please, the floor is yours. Hello. Hello, everyone. And welcome to the session on antibiotic stewardship in the EU Jamarai. Kaselnik and I'm joined here by my colleague Marie Molvik from the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. We should have been joined by our Spanish partner in this project, um, Antonio Lopez, but uh, unfortunately, given the state of the world at the moment, he has been called away on important COVID-19 business. Um, from our point of view, this has been a very fruitful three years, and we've delighted today to have the opportunity to discuss some of the aspects of our work with all of you. 
But first, we'd like to show you a video summarizing our work. So if we could play the video, please. I think it's coming, but I may have... Antimicrobial stewardship is one of the core strategies to combat AMR. It is defined as a coherent set of actions that promotes the responsible use of antimicrobials. There already are guidelines for the prudent use of antimicrobials in both human and animal health. However, the focus and the level of implementation of antimicrobial stewardship actions varies a lot across the European countries. EU Jamright has worked to identify the concrete tools to guide countries to be more effective in their stewardship efforts for human health and animal health. EU JAMRAI identified a lack of efficient and easily accessible tools to facilitate the implementation of antimicrobial stewardship at both country and healthcare level. After setting up a survey to identify antibiotic stewardship programmes in Europe, EU JAMRAI revised the available materials and structured them by level of care, hospital care, long-term care facilities and primary care. The result is a repository with existing guidelines, tools and implementation methods for antibiotic stewardship in human health. This repository has been well received and already used, among others, by the ARCH network. EU JAMRAI also organised a workshop with experts from 22 European countries who discussed the barriers and enablers of good stewardship programmes in their own countries. The results showed us that hospitals currently have far more actions in place than community settings. And while there has been a lot of recent action for family doctors, experience with long-term care facilities especially is lagging behind. There are success factors and problems specific, of course, to each country. But our workshop also helped us to identify that there is a lot of common ground and that countries can benefit from the findings of other member states. Building up on the results from the workshop, EU JAMRAI has conducted a qualitative study in seven different European countries to assess attitude towards core elements of antimicrobial stewardship at different levels of care, national, hospital, long-term care facilities and primary care. Our objective with this qualitative evaluation was exploring more deeply the experiences of implementation by professionals at different levels of care to find barriers and success stories. We focused on identifying themes that can be vital for better implementation of antimicrobial stewardship programs, and we are glad to see that the results are already being used to inform the content and action points of upcoming national action plans. In order to assess the level of implementation and acceptance of stewardship programs in animal health, EU JAMRAI developed a survey that was disseminated through partners and stakeholders. The aim of this activity was to identify the core components needed for implementation of antimicrobial stewardship in animal health and then provide this information to member states to support them in the design of their own stewardship programmes. The core components needed for optimal implementation of antimicrobial stewardship in animals is broader than in humans due to the variety of production systems in animal species. When developing a stewardship programme, it's important to define objectives, identify all actors that need to be involved, and periodically assess the progress to review the strategy when needed. Results of the questionnaire are already being used to propose a stewardship programme suitable for adaptation to different contexts and countries. Structured around different strategic and specific actions, it can be used in both companion and production animals. Now, we encourage member states to continue involving the key stakeholders in animal health in order to publish a white book on the implementation of antimicrobial stewardship in animal health. We need further consensus in the definition of a common structure, the description of the core elements, the roles of the each core professional, and the indicator to assess the problem. The work of EU JAMRAI to increase antibiotic prudent use should be sustained because it can be helpful in reviewing national efforts and improving knowledge. 
A qualitative study, for example, can contribute with valuable information about the most appropriate core elements of antimicrobial stewardship programs and the most significant enablers and barriers for successful implementation. Despite European Union plan and guidelines, EU member states do not reach the same level of achievement on antibiotic responsible use. To overcome this barrier, the EU should prioritize further efforts on antimicrobial stewardship by developing European core elements for antibiotic stewardship programs for both human and animal health. We need to create the minimum framework to be used by all member states and increase antibiotic prudent use across Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much to the communication team for a, a great video. We had suggested that they use Hollywood actors to replace us, but unfortunately the EU Jamarai budget did not extend that far. Um, we will now move on to our discussions. Um, please remember that if you have any questions, post them in the chat, and if there's enough time, we'll try to um, get to them. Um, as you all saw in the film, we have held both international, an international workshop and conducted a large international qualitative, qualitative study to look at how best to implement the core elements and competencies of antibiotic stewardship throughout Europe. We're lucky today um, to have three speakers who we hope can help us elaborate on this and find out how best to get the job done in a One Health world. I'd like first to introduce our three speakers. The first, Dr. Jesus Rodriguez Baño, is head of the Infectious Disease Division at the hosp uh, hospital, at the University Hospital of the Virgen Macarena and Professor of Medicine at the University of Sevilla, coordinator of the Spanish Network of Research in Infectious Diseases and past president of ESCMED. Dr. Nenad Mikovic currently is director of finance of the European Association of Hospital Pharmacists. He also works as the head of the hospital pharmacy services at the Institute of Orthopedics in Belgrade. And in addition to his work in the hospital uh, and for EAP, Nenad leads the hospital pharmacy section of the Pharmaceutical Association of Serbia. We are also joined in this first session by Dr. Thierry Jambon from Brittany in France. Thierry is a veterinary practitioner specialized in poultry pathology, but he's also currently the vice president of the Federation of Veterinarians of Europe and past president for the section of veterinary practice, uh, practitioners of FVAA. So uh, we can see we're joined by a very distinguished panel. I'd like to begin with my first question to Dr. Bagno. The EU uh, Jamarai workshop and questionnaire confirmed both a big variation, but also many common problems in stewardship across Europe. Given the variation in resistance patterns and local legislation and health structures, how universal do you think the core elements are and competencies in a European perspective? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Oliver. Just one second to say thank you for the organizers to count on me and ask me to participate uh, in all you Jambrai activities and congratulations to the whole you Jambrai team for the big achievements performed during this year. So congratulations, well done. So uh, I, well, I think this this is uh, come to a very important issue regarding to antibiotic use, which is the heterogeneity in the use that antibiotics uh, uh, that we can witness in, you know, Europe, both in the amount of antibiotics that are consumed, but also in the selection of specific type of antibiotics. Uh, the problem is that, as you all very well know, antibiotics are prescribed by all medical specialties, despite most of the medical spe specialties are not, let's say, primarily expert on antibiotics, but they have to use it. So uh, it, it brings us to the problem of training in the antibiotic use as a core issue in the in the in this field so when ESMIT started to work in this area we realized that this heterogeneity was a big problem and the huge MRI uh, questionnaire confirmed this very important variation and then we we think that having these uh, core competencies defined and written is a very nice first step to know where we should be working uh, on so these competencies, let's say, are the goal. These competencies are uh, to show the countries and to show universities, to show uh, hospitals, where should we try to move 
where are the baseline background that we, we need to address. But this is, as I said, just a first step. The problem is that we need to put this in the uh, political agenda for medical decisions in the terms of training programs, in terms of uh, both for in, in medical schools and, and special, uh, specialty training. And we need to try to measure how the implementation of these competencies are taken in our training program. So I would say that uh, in the question, local resistance patterns is an important difference, but it does not uh, explain our heterogeneity. Our heterogeneity comes more from different historical reasons, training programs and activities, and therefore is where uh, this uh, competency will help us to improve. Thank you very much. Um, the second question is to uh, Thierry. And uh, Thierry, in general, a stewardship program involves implementing prevention measures and management strategies to prevent disease of animals, using antimicrobials carefully, judiciously, and with a continual evaluation of the outcomes of therapy. From your point of view, can you comment on the state of implementation of this concept of antimicrobial stewardship in animal health? Thank you, Oliver. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting the veterinary profession as stakeholders in this program. In this program. Uh, the concept of antimicrobial stewardship and responsible use in animal health is well established. It is also part of university training to become a veterinarian. Looking at FV, we did our first conference on antimicrobial stewardship and AMR already in 2003. EPIRUMA, the European Platform for Responsible Use of Medicines in Animals, was already set up in 2005. FV, the Federation of Veterinarians of Europe, and the veterinary profession have been working hard for more than two decades on how to reduce the need treat animals with antimicrobials and how to put in place preventive measures. This has been done in combination with many awareness campaigns to use antimicrobials prudently to prevent AMR. The animal health sector has done this with great results. The latest ESVAC report, you know ESVAC is the European Surveillance of Veterinary Antibiotic Consumption, shows a decrease by more than 34% of the overall sales of veterinary antimicrobials between 2011 and 2018. Another important achievement is the decreasing trend seen for the critically important antibiotics classified by EMA and the MA category B, especially the sales of polymyxins, for example, colistin, which reduced by 69%, it's a lot. And we continue. The new veterinary medicine regulation, you heard about it yesterday, will allow us to get a better insight into antibiotic use per animal species and the impact on antimicrobial resistance. We also further promote good housing, good husbandry, and the use of robust animals together with a well-established disease prevention program in order to further reduce the need the use of antimicrobials in animals. Regular animal health visits by veterinarians, but veterinarians are crucial to do this. It is uh, the role of the new animal health law. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting and important perspective. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll move straight on to our third question uh, to, to Nenad. Hello. Uh, we've seen during the EU JAMRI that there's sometimes, unfortunately, a gap between academic knowledge and implementation. How do you think we can best share success factors and experience of using the core elements to improve stewardship across Europe? Thank you for inviting me. Before answering your question, I would really like to, to thank you and to, for the opportunity to, to reflect on the work of EU JAMRI. And I would also like to reiterate this work was supported throughout the initiative by my colleague, Dr. Stefan Amann, and our policy officer from our Brussels office, Stephanie Cole. As for your question, I can confirm and affirm the existence of a gap between knowledge and implementation. And for EHP and its members, it is thus of uttermost interest that skills for the creation and the successful implementation of stewardship teams 
are not only acquired in a theoretical manner, but also through hands-on experience to facilitate the exchange of best practices between different health systems and hospitals. Our association, EHP, created the Statement Implementation Learning Collaborative Centers program, which allows uh, hospital pharmacists uh, working in hospitals across Europe uh, as EHP member countries to learn more about pharmacy procedures linked to the European statements of hospital pharmacy, particularly related to AMR. One of the Silk hosts um, has extensive experience in mentoring pharmacists to increase the rational basis of anti-infective therapy, uh, antimicrobial stewardship, in fact, in our hospitals. So we, we hope that with this, we can really reduce this, uh, this gap. Thank you very much. Mari, I don't know, do we have time for one question? Uh, well, I think maybe we have uh, one, one more minute for one question, but we didn't receive any from the public, but uh, maybe I can allow me to ask one question then. Um, um, I think to Nenet uh, Milkovic, how important do you find the development of European core elements and competencies? Thank you, Marie. For, for us, for EHP, the development of European-wide core elements and competencies is very important. This has manifested itself in the Common Training Framework project of our association, through which EHP has created a competency framework for hospital pharmacy specialization that can be applied across its 35 member organizations. Through the development of European core elements and competences, the overall quality, safety and equity of access to patient care can be enhanced in every European country. In the field of AMR stewardship approaches that have been harmonized through Europe can ensure that all patients are treated with the same standards, that clinical services are improved, and that the benefits of multidisciplinary stewardship teams involving physicians, hospital pharmacists, and other specialties uh, are exploited in the best possible manner. Thank you very much. Uh, I think now we're going to get ready uh, for the next round table. I think one of the take home messages from this session is that there is a Norwegian expression, which is that sometimes it feels like it's a mile to get out of the front door. And uh, hopefully we've now taken that first step and that, uh, that mile is shortening. Um, I'd like to express again the thanks to the EU Jamarite to all our speakers so far. And we're now going to move on from the contents of stewardship uh, to the people who are actually involved. We've seen throughout the EU Jamarai that methods have to be adapted to take into account cultural and personal differences between countries, but also between professions and types of healthcare. Our two speakers today have a vast amount of experience in this field, and I hope they can shed some light on this very interesting aspect and very important aspect of our work against AMR. We're joined today by Professor Michael Borg. He's a clinical microbiologist by training and heads the Department of Infection Control at the Mater Dei Hospital in Malta and chairs the country's National Antibiotic Committee. He's also a past chair, uh, chairman of the International Federation of Infection Control, EFIC. Dr. Smita Charanai, uh, is a qualified clinical pharmacist whose research has focused on understanding the influence of culture and context on antimicrobial prescribing behaviours. She's an honorary associate professor at the University of Cape Town and a visiting professor at the Academy of Health Sciences in the UK and India. So thank you very much both of you for giving us your time today. I'd like to start with a question uh, to you, Esmita. Throughout the EU Jamarai, we have learned that there are many structural and cultural differences in Europe. What do you think is the role of the individual healthcare practitioner in affecting change? And how can we make these change, uh, these change behaviours sustainable? Thank you very much. And I'd like to uh, congratulate my fellow European colleagues on the great project. And it's been a pleasure to be able to participate in it in this manner. Um, I think the, the focus on sustainability is key. And this has been a thread throughout your video and the previous um, eminent speakers that you had in that in order to achieve sustainability, and we know this from many different fields in implementation science, is, is to ensure that there is flexibility in interventions we want to implement so that they fit the context for which they are going to work. Um, and that is 
having the, the least common denominator, as you say, across Europe in core elements for antimicrobial stewardship, but identifying that these need to be adapted to the local resources um, and the context and cultural uh, differences within each country and also within teams in hospitals and across sectors. Um, and one of the key things for me um, as, as a pharmacist who's been, who's been involved in antimicrobial stewardship is, is seeing the disparity in who is allowed to be involved in antimicrobial stewardship and infection prevention and control activities across Europe. There is a huge heterogeneity in, in the actors and that's something that we can change. We can encourage uh, greater involvement of nursing colleagues and pharmacist colleagues who have huge uh, roles to play in patient care and delivering antimicrobial stewardship and infection prevention and control. So I think, um, of course, there is individual level um, behaviors and drivers that we can focus on, but there are also structural, strategic and organizational ones that should focus on greater inclusivity of the different healthcare professionals. Thank you very much. Uh, and the second question is to you, Michael. Um, our survey revealed that uh, change can be affected relatively quickly if there's enough interest, support and resources, obviously. However, uh, many programmes are limited in terms of funding and time. How do you think we can ensure lasting change in uh, individual practice once those organs of change have disappeared? I'm afraid we can't hear you at the moment. Yeah, you will now. Okay. So, um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for the for the invite and many congratulations for the really interesting conclusions of of the project. Uh, this is this is a, a a key a key question, Oliver. And I think um, to to start to even scratch the surface, we need to to differentiate between the types of behaviour change interventions. Now, the the easiest to implement and and I would imagine this is what, what you alluded to, are what we call transactional interventions. So these basically deal with processes. So for example, if you're looking at prophylaxis in surgery, you may think of introducing a restrictive policy to um, uh, reduce incorrect use. And these do indeed work in the short term. They're very good short-term levers. But as, as Asmita also alluded to, um, uh, they, they do tend, however, to have challenges with sustainability. And we see it from the literature, um, uh, publications, where initially there is a success and then it tends to, to lag off. And, and the key is that we should aim beyond transactional change into transformational change. And transformational change deals with the values. And I think this is, this is the, the, the take home message to answer your question. So when you have the funding, when you have the time, when you have the, the energy in the intervention, we shouldn't just focus on the process. We need to deal with the values. We need to ensure, again, as Asmita mentioned, a culture change so that physicians and other stakeholders really believe that the stewardship program is really relevant, it's useful, and it is important. And for this, we need to become better behavior change agents. Um, there's not a lot in the medical literature, but there's a wealth of information in industry because industry has been in the forefront of this. And the, the final take home message I would say is, look at, these, um, look at this literature, learn how we can be better at transformation and change. The information is there. We just need to adapt it from industry into a medical perspective. That's very interesting. Thank you. Mari, I think we have some time for additional questions. Uh, yes, we do. And, uh, but we haven't really received any yet, but please um, just let me know and I will ask the questions. But I have one question for Esmita. Uh, the EU DRAM RISE suggested the need for tailored interventions aimed at different professional groups, as you talked a little bit about, such as doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and management. How important do you think these specialized interventions are and how best to implement them? Thank you. That's a really important question. Um, and I think it goes back to what Professor Borg was saying is about understanding the values um, over processes. And there are also different values when you look at professional groups and, and the priorities they have for patient care. Um, and even within professionals, so if you look at the differences between medical and surgical um, 
culture of care for patients, there, is, there are differences in how infection management is prioritized uh, and what, what values are attributed to different risk outcomes. So I think it's really important to firstly understand these um, values that, that different professional groups and within professionals, different specialties attribute to patient outcomes and patient care. And that's how we can develop interventions that are going to be sustainable. For example, if I was to speak to surgical teams about infections, I wouldn't talk about antimicrobial resistance. It's much more um, feasible, much more sustainable to speak with surgical teams about specific outcomes, length of stay in hospital, uh, surgical outcomes for patients, and then they will listen and start um, taking into consideration the value of antimicrobial stewardship to outcomes of interest to them. Um, likewise, for nursing teams, I think with nurses, um, we there is a huge potential, but we have to focus on training and we have to focus on developing a culture where nurses are allowed to participate, are fully uh, part of teams when it comes to stewardship interventions. So I think it has to be a very broad look at how we collectively as teams work with each other and give the opportunity to each other to work in this field. Thank you. I think we have maybe time for one more question for Michael. Um, yeah. I see there's I've, one. Go ahead. I've received an interesting question here. Um, in your opinion, how has COVID-19 impacted antibiotic stewardship behaviors? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Um, something that I'm looking at over here, I think it's, it's impacted in, in two areas. I think it's impacted in antibiotic stewardship as well as in infection prevention control. I think in infection prevention control, what we're seeing in many centers is that hand hygiene has improved because now there is um, a, a, an important um, driver of self-protection more than anything else. And in fact, what we've seen in my institution is that although we have to scale down on, on programs such as screening for MRSA, our rates remained almost the same because of the increase in hand hygiene. With antibiotic stewardship, unfortunately, I don't think the same can be said. And again, um, uh, we are seeing, uh, at least this is, this is um, from my center, but I've spoken to people and they're getting the same, the same, and I got the same feedback is that um, use of antibiotics has increased um, because obviously uh, people are very apprehensive. Uh, they're, they don't have many, many um, therapeutic alternatives for COVID-19. Uh, pneumonias and, and chest infections. So I think it's it's the, the challenge of antibiotic stewardship has maybe been made um, that little bit more um, uh, challenging with, with, with the pandemic. Thank you very much, Esmita and, and Michael. That was great. Um, we're now going to prepare for the last panel in this session. Um, as we've heard, there are many ways of motivating people and targets and indicators are an intrinsic part of many national action plans and One Health strategies throughout Europe. Uh, one of the questions we've asked ourselves throughout the EU JAMRI is what's the appropriate level and setting for these targets? Should it be local, national or transnational? And we've invited two people today who have experience of this uh, to help us discuss this. We're honoured today to be joined by Dr Rosa Pedan. Uh, she's currently Senior Advisor and Coordinator for the International AMR for International AMR, the Department of International Affairs of the Ministry of Health, Welfare and Sport in the Netherlands. Rosa is a doctor in veterinary medicine and coordinated the first EU action plan against AMR. She's also currently the chair of the working group of the task force of the AMR Codex Alimentris and the vice chair of the working of work package of the AMR of the Global Health Security Agenda. She's also, we're lucky enough to say, one of the leaders of one of the other work packages in the EU JAMRI. Dr. Jose Miguel Sinceros is the head of the Department of Infectious Diseases, Microbiology and Preventative Medicine at the University Hospital Virgen del Rocío in Sevilla, Spain. He's also the coordinator of the PIRASOA program in, Andal in Andalusia, which has formed a huge part of the EU JAMRI uh, work package 7. So we're lucky to say he's been one of our joint leaders focusing on the surveillance parts. So thank you very much to both of you today for joining us. The first question is uh, to you, Rosa. Um, 
Throughout the EU GMRI, there's been a lot of discussion about the relative importance of national targets and guidelines against local ones. The practice varies throughout the EU and through Europe. What do you think are the benefits and disadvantages of setting national and local indicators and targets? Thank you. Thank you, Oliver, and uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to this uh, panel discussion. And uh, of course, I will uh, I will focus uh, our um, my answer on on the experience of the Netherlands that maybe will not be the same or can not be uh, appropriate for all countries because the situation in the Netherlands. Uh, has been particular, but of course this is what we have in the European Union, that we have 27 member states and all of them are different. So uh, in 2015, the Netherlands developed a national action plan, was approved, was uh, done in uh, by three ministries at the time, Ministry of Health, Agriculture and also Ministry of Environment, but we didn't develop uh, uh, action plan as can be thought, but we did it uh, sending a letter, a joint letter, letter by the three ministers to the uh, Dutch parliament. So in this letter were uh, seven elements developed and uh, one of them was what uh, human healthcare, veterinary, site, environment, research, etc, etc, etc. So in each of these fields, we developed some uh, targets or goals to be achieved by this uh, during the period of the five years that this uh, national action plan uh, should be in place. Um, as you may know, because it was very famous at the time, was the 70% reduction in the veterinary field and the use of antimicrobials. But this was uh, not a new target because before this action plan we already had this target for the veterinary sector. So thinking uh, in the human healthcare sector, that is the one that I am uh, working with, at the moment we had also five walls, uh, very specific five walls to be achieved in these five years. Uh, and if you, if you may remember, the Netherlands was at the time and maybe still now, one of the countries with the less consumption of antimicrobials in the human health sector. So uh, that was really tricky to develop targets for something that already you think that is going good. But we had uh, for the political pressure at the moment to put some targets. And the targets were really ambitious, were, for example, reduction of 50% of avoidable healthcare associated infections, reduction of 50% of incorrectly prescribed antimicrobials, reduction in the emergency and a spread of multi resistant bacteria, equal level or decrease on the number of infections or death during the period of five years, and no reduction of the possibilities for effective treatment of patients. So these are really, were really very ambitious uh, targets. So the question was how to achieve these goals. So first of all, we, we learned from what was already have been done in the veterinary sector. And we knew that was very important to have, first of all, a very good mapping of this situation to know where are the possibilities uh, to still improve. And what was also important is um, to, 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 to put a budget available for all the period of the action plan and to see additionally which measures are needed. So not only uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, the, uh, that, uh, that you have all the people together to develop these measures, but also, in some cases, we need additional legislation to reinforce uh, some, uh, some, uh, some aspects or to have uh, uh, benchmarking, benchmarking ways of, of seeing how, 
how the, the situation is evolving. So based on that, after uh, we develop lots of measures, we develop uh, eight teams, stewardship uh, teams in hospitals, we reinforce and create networks. We ask professional associations to develop guidelines. Uh, so we went from top, top down to see how to implement it. But then we, in 2020, we had to evaluate the action plan. And then is when you come to uh, how, how you have done. And we, uh, this was done by an external uh, evaluator. And what we realized is that we had very nice political, what we call aspirational targets, but for some of them, we didn't have uh, the way of evaluating it. Because how you can evaluate if the number of infections or deaths due to antimicrobial resistance is the same. You need, first of all, a baseline. And, and after that, yeah, really complicated. So we, we had this experience that we know by numbers because uh, we, we can see how is the consumption of antimicrobials, if the level of resistance of some bacteria is more or less. But some of the targets that we put that were aspirational political targets were very difficult to translate into numbers to say yes or not. From the other side, speaking with our healthcare inspectorate, that is the one that is controlling all the measures, we had also the conclusion that in some cases, uh, putting indicators is nice and is useful, but you not, don't need to focus only on indicators because this can be perverse. Instead of uh, you are only focusing on getting this number done, instead of creating all the structures that for the long term will be sustainable to, to, have, to, to, to sustain all the measures and to have a long term uh, improvement of the situation. So I think that that is experience in the Netherlands for the human health care sector. Thank you very much, Rodos. I think there's a lot to learn there. As you said, although situations may be different in different countries, I think there's always a learning opportunities there. Uh, Jose Miguel, uh, question for you now, uh, one which is actually quite close to my heart. And the question really is, how do we best give local bodies, so local uh, areas, responsibility for meeting national targets? There's always been a challenge in somehow transferring ownership of national action plans and targets uh, from national bodies to individuals. Can you comment on that for us, please? Yes, thank you, Oliver, uh, for inviting me uh, to discuss in this panel. Uh, uh, I think the, the answer is through benchmarking and transparency of results. Once the local, national, and European objective has been defined and published, each of the corresponding institutions must implement the measure and intervention to achieve those goals. And the result achieved should be shared, publicized on a regular basis. In this way, each organization will be able to see the evolution of each data and compare it with that the others which is a powerful motivation factor and in my opinion education is the key to engage citizens in the fight against antimicrobial resistance ideally it should part in primary education and continue through all stages of education the media and social network are powerful educational tool that should contribute to educating the population on the fundamentals on the fight against antimicrobial resistance. Thank you very much, uh, Jose Miguel. Uh, Marie, are there any questions from the public? And if not, I have a couple of questions. And there's one question, I think, for you, Rosa. With the great accomplishments of the animal health sector achieving its goals, has this had any impact on human health goals? Um, uh, now, what uh, I think that this uh, the 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 achievement in the reduction that took place in the veterinary sector is what has also drive the 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 to setting goals in the human healthcare sector. 
and and the reflection even if we are the best in europe in 2015 we can always uh, go further and improve the sectors where we saw that were still possibilities for improvement and this was for example i remember the long term uh, nursing uh, healthcare um, settings nursing homes uh, we saw, for example, that uh, between uh, GPs were huge difference on prescription levels, etc. So this this triggering, this reduction in the in the and this goal that we saw that was achievable in the human in the veterinary healthcare sector uh, has been also the motivation to put targets in the human healthcare uh, sector. I don't know if this was exactly the question. Uh, thank you. I think that was a good question. Mari, do we have time for me to, to ask uh, Jose Miguel one question? Yes, we have three minutes left. Great, thank you. Jose Miguel, I'm going to take advantage that I, I have you here on the spot to ask you a question that I've been thinking about to ask you before, which is, have you reflected on the composition when we talk about local surveillance and local targets um who is it who should be part of this group and these teams we have a teams which are multidisciplinary teams with pharmacists doctors etc but when it comes to targets who, who at the local level who is it who should be setting the targets i think um at the local level is very very important to included uh, in the multidisciplinary team every specialist around the uh, uh, different specialities related to infectious disease prevention diagnosis and therapy and together with the pharmaceuticals and of course in with the the, the nurse uh, particularly uh, training in antimicrobial use and uh, this uh, multidisciplinary team need to uh, guide by a mix of uh, leadership and institutional support. Uh, I think this, uh, this uh, combination is key to the sex for this program because in the past it was very common to uh, start this program by the voluntary attitude. And we need, of course, the institutional support at the most high level. In this case, in the director, in the, the, the director of the hospital. Thank you, Miguel. Jose Miguel. Mari, we have time for one no. more question. Perhaps? No, we don't. I get the message that we have no more time. So. Uh, at that note, I'd like to draw to a close uh, this part of the final conference of the EU Jamarai uh, on behalf of the uh, the program and on behalf of the Norwegian Institute of Public Health today I'd like to say thank you very much to all of our speakers uh, today I think it's been very sporty to come up in this kind of digital conference and have your your moment in in the light um, and uh, it's been very interesting and we've learned a lot so on behalf of the EU GMRI thank you very very much for today and for the last several years thank you we can now move on to the next thank session thank you thank you Bye. Hello, wow, thank you for this very interesting conversation. Thank you to you all. So now we saw how important the appropriate use of antimicrobial in human and animal health is. Now we're going to talk of infection prevention and control. And so how the WHO would say clean care is better care. So I'm delighted to give the floor to Johan Lacotte from the French National Institute for Health and Medical Research. He's been co-lead on the work packet nine, prioritizing and implementing research and innovation for public health needs. And Mariana Tsana, who I think is experiencing some uh, internet connection issues, but she might be with us. She's from the National Public Health uh, Institute of Greece, and she's the co-lead of work packet six for policies for prevention of healthcare associated infection and their implementation. Please, the floor is yours, but first we're going to watch a short video on IPC. Thank you. A 
effective infection prevention and control measures are necessary to control the spread of infections like COVID-19, as well as minimize everyday healthcare associated infections. Fewer infections in hospitals result in lower consumption of antibiotics, thereby reducing antibiotic resistance. EU JAMRAI has worked on piloting the implementation of guidelines and frameworks to make infection prevention and control more effective following two approaches, top-down and bottom-up. The first step was to identify gaps on European infection prevention and control programmes, conducting two surveys with different objectives. The first survey aimed at identifying the gaps between policy and infection control and practice, while the second one pursued identifying the gaps between organisational culture and patient safety. The results of the surveys depict not only the necessary institutional structures and resources needed for an effective infection prevention control implementation, but also the barriers to overcome and the behavioural changes needed. Some of the gaps are lack of active involvement of hospital administrators and clinical department heads, insufficient cooperation between hospital administrators, IPC teams and public health authorities and lack of human and budgetary resources. To fill in these gaps, EU JAMRAI has piloted the implementation of the Universal Infection Control Framework in 22 healthcare settings from five countries. The objectives of the Universal Infection Control Framework are firstly to raise awareness on antimicrobial resistance and healthcare associated infections and the consequences of these public health threats on patient safety. Secondly, to make infection prevention and control implementation more effective by strengthening and improving the already IPC implemented activities, clarifying roles in implementing activities without additional cost or resource. And finally, to train on basic infection control principles and on the use of tools to promote behavioural change such as audits, infection control gap assessments, the cost effectiveness of IPC and other communication and collaboration activities. Universal Infection Control Framework and its training tools are addressed to all infection control hierarchies, hospital administrators, healthcare workers and infection control committees. Even though the personnel have to manage the pandemic of COVID, they reported that this crisis was as an opportunity to implement some of the essential activities. A tool like this can have an impact in changing the behavioural culture of the healthcare settings regarding the prevention and control of healthcare associated infections. Even though the implementation of the framework was challenged by the COVID-19 crisis, the review of the 22 healthcare settings depicts how effective these activities could be. After evaluating its implementation, these 22 healthcare settings the Universal Infection Control Framework was updated and published and will be shared with all EU member states. The feedback by the participants showed that the Universal Infection Control Framework could have an impact in changing the behavioural culture of the organisation, therefore its promotion to other healthcare settings is of highly importance to have more concrete and measurable results. Moreover, collaborating with scientific organisations and societies at the European level with the purpose of improving the already developed training tools, as well as advocating for their establishment through the healthcare workers' curriculum, will result in the sustainability of the actions. Using an evidence-based implementation model called the Breakthrough Series Model for Improvement, EU JAMRAI implemented guidelines for prevention of catheter-associated urinary tract infections in 30 pilot wards of eight EU member states and three non-EU countries in Europe. The Breakthrough Series model for improvement promotes collaboration between different levels and provides a structure that includes key elements for a successful implementation process. The model is following a bottom-up approach involving the ward staff in the process in deciding and prioritizing changes. 
The model is designed to bring knowledge into practice and improve quality. Before starting the implementation, the hospital wards answered a survey to identify the areas that needed improvement during county prevention. The experiences of using the implementation model were positive. Among the facilitating factors were management support and motivated staff with an active role in decision making and prioritising changes. Some of the barriers reported were cultural aspects and lack of resources. In terms of results, some examples that wards are reporting are decreased use of urinary catheters, increased compliance to standard precautions, procurement of closed collection systems and development of national guidelines on county prevention. We're glad to see that the results have gone beyond our objectives. Prevention of healthcare associated infection is a cornerstone in controlling AMR and participating countries have reported achievements such as the development of a national plan to reduce healthcare associated infections, implementation of guidelines for county prevention in more hospitals and continued use of the model in other hospitals for structured quality improvement work. EU Chambrai conducted a survey addressed to member states and stakeholders that showed that healthcare associated infections are a priority at all levels of the health system. Effective inf infection prevention and control measures go well beyond hand washing. They involve also many actors and need a coordinated approach to ensure that no EU country is left behind. As COVID-19 has demonstrated to the world, the only step that can be taken to control the spread of a novel virus with pandemic potential are effective infection prevention and control measures. This crisis has also shown that we need a common framework. That's why UJAMRI urges Member States and the European Commission to develop core elements on infection prevention and control. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second session of the day dedicated to infection prevention and control. I am Johan Lacotte from France, from the uh, work package on research and innovation, and I will share this session with Mariana Tsana from Greece. Mariana? Uh, thank you for the introduction, Johan. My name is Mariana Tsana. Uh, I am from the National Public Health of Greece, and I am the project man manager of work package 6.1. Uh, I have some internet connection problems, but I hope we will be okay. So, shall we begin? Yes, let's begin. Uh, as highlighted in the video, infection prevention and control was one of the cornerstone of UJAMRI objective. IPC can be one of the most cost-effective intervention to combat AMR. In 2018, an OECD report estimated that promoting simple IPC measures such as N hygiene could reduce by about 40% the AMR health burden with less infection, less antibiotic usage, and therefore less resistance. Not to mention that IPC measures also reduce the multitude of non-resistance healthcare associated infection, causing extra days of stay in hospital and representing a financial loss of several billions euro each year in Europe. IPC could really be a game changer. Yet, most of IPC guidelines are still based on weak to moderate evidence uh, and as highlighted in the video, their effective implementation face uh, various barriers. To discuss how to build from EU German results and to improve our practices in Europe, I am delighted to present you today the panelists from our roundtable on how to strengthen IPC uh, in Europe to fade AMR. So let me introduce today the Dr. Diamantis Plahuras, uh, who is an expert in antimicrobial resistance and healthcare associated infection from the UCDC. We also have Mr. Bear Omen, the executive director of the ESNO, the U European Specialist Nurse Organization. 
Uh, we also have Mr. Uh, Anders Johansson, who is representing the UK group, so the European uh, Committee on Infection Control. Uh, and finally, Mr. Alberto Torres, uh, who is the head of the Preventive Medicine and Public Health Service uh, in a Merchant Hospital, an hospital who was involved in uh, um, our activities. Thank you all for uh, ac accepting our invitation today, and let's now start our roundtable. Uh, so, as I mentioned in my uh, introduction, IPC can really be a game changer. Uh, and uh, the, rest, the recent COVID-19 crisis also reminded us that uh, when we lack effective treatments, IPC is the only protection left. Um, so. My first question will be to all panelists. Uh, after this crisis, do you see a risk for IPC resources to, to be more focused on pandemic prevention rather than on healthcare associated infection and AMR? Or on the opposite, do you think that the recent focus on IPC, uh, thanks to the COVID-19 crisis, will uh, benefit AMR? Diamantis, would you go first? Thank you so much, uh, Johan, and thank you everyone uh, for the for the invitation to uh, be part of this of this panel. Well, that, that, I think that's uh, a million dollar question. So uh, the effect of the pandemic, of course, on AMR is still uh, is still unknown. Uh, as you said, on the one hand, the pandemic certainly has brought IPC in the spotlight, and uh, there is awareness among uh, healthcare professionals, administrators, and even the public. So this is certainly a very positive development. And uh, I think it is important to keep the momentum of this. However, on the other hand, the pandemic has also adverse effects. And there are many reports of harmful practices, such as, I mean, I will just mention not changing gloves or gowns when going from one patient to another, things that we have been trying for many, many years to uh, to stop and now we're seeing these uh, these again hand hygiene has can also be neglected in these cases but i mean i think one of the probable serious developments uh, is crowding in the hospitals shortages of healthcare staff and consequently large workloads and this is what we've been seeing again and again during this uh, pandemic and i think these factors are very well known you know to negatively impact uh, ipc and if we combine this to indiscriminate antibiotic use, we may think, I'm afraid, uh, we may see an increase in AMR in the near future. So we need to keep advocating and promoting appropriate IPC practices to avoid this. Thank you. Thank you, Diamantis. Bear, what is your insight on this question? Yeah, thank you for uh, thank you for the question and also uh, for the uh, participation in this uh, very very uh, impressive event. But also the congratulations. So sorry, but I have to start with congratulations to the full team. But also um, uh, expressing uh, how the dynamics, the positive dynamics, lead to where we are at the moment. Uh, we started with AMR, we were talking with infection prevention control, uh, but over a year time, no a year ago, no one was interested in microbes. But now, a year, a year later, everyone is talking about microbes. And um, we have been creating a kind of a nurse's guide uh, on, on, on microbes and also have a special session on uh, infection prevention control because uh, you cannot talk about AMR without infection prevention. So they are so they so they uh, they they are com, uh, they are com, uh, combined. Um, what we also see that such a program uh, has uh, created external um, uh, dynamics. Just making friends, we uh, we got a lot of, we got to know a lot of organizations uh, with students, healthcare professionals, also with the industry, with the European Commission, but also internal. So. Uh, our, our organization wasn't aware so much on this topic. So through such a project as this, uh, it really became also to the, uh, uh, on the top of our, our agenda. So uh, what we see at the moment on this, uh, on this COVID, um, we see the immense uh, relevance 
of, uh, hygiene, of, of hygiene and infection prevention control. And uh, in our group, we, uh, in our organization, we have established uh, a very impressive group of nurses, uh, nurses also uh, um, from, uh, um, from, uh, from, from, from Malta. And, um, but uh, the, the thing is that you have to, um, to, to put this agenda always uh, uh, very far more, far more at the top as, as we've seen, uh, as, as we've seen in, pre in previous years, and this only can be done uh, with uh, with really good co co collaboration. So, with, uh, as, uh, if, for example, if you're looking at the flu at the moment, everyone was talking about uh, the flu, but when this distancing, you know, you, you, we have seen the impact of it that the flu has has dropped really down. So uh, as, uh, we do think that this uh, this is a very important aspect in the in the overall healthcare uh, provision. And let me also last say, last year we had the uh, the year of the nurse, Florence Nightingale. Everyone did know this, ladies. And the first thing that you said is infection prevention, infection prevention, just uh, and and and, hy and and hygiene. So. For us, uh, we had a great learning curves, but we still will uh, uh, will go on with uh, with, uh, with this aspect. So, yeah. Thank you, Bear. Anders, what is your opinion? Will the COVID crisis will will be a risk or a benefit for AMR and healthcare associated infection prevention? I thank you very much for the invitation on behalf of UKIC. You know, I'm inclined to see opportunities rather than obstacles, maybe as a person, but I think this is really true. I think there are opportunities, but what happens is highly dependent on how we together play our, our cards, I think. Uh, three opportunities would be, first, you know, the level of interest has never been this high in IPC. And it's all across the medical professions, it's across all healthcare fields, but even more importantly, in all other parts of the society, including economy, politics, and the ordinary man on the street are interested right now. That's a great opportunity. Second, you know, improved IPC will always gain the fight of the AMR pandemic. If we improve IPC, we will improve the fight against AMR. So I think. Uh, uh, the level of interest and, and the IPC focus will gain the AMR work. I'm sure of that. There may be clashes between interests of different groups of people working in this field, but there is in no way a clash between the goals of IPC and the fight against AMR. Key words are and will be collaboration and together, I think. I think we should strive to, to do that in the future. We should continue on that path we are already on to, to collaborate between I, I, a fight against AMR and the IPC people. Uh, I think uh, we, will, we have seen a gradual change in that over the past 20 years, more and more collaboration. We shouldn't be in different fields sort of IPC and uh, fight against AMR and we, and we need to continue that. And for the third thing I, I think is, um, you know, IPC is a discipline that always work in the spirit of changing people's behavior. And, and, and the pandemic will not change the IPC spirit of changing people's behavior now. So I, I don't think the pandemic is a bad thing for AMR fight through IPC work. Thanks. Thank you. Alberto? It is um, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I said thank you very much, Johanna Mariana, and good morning. <clears throat> uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Spanish team for its effort and leadership, and, and especially the team also from Murcia, with whom we have been working so closely for the last few years. Uh, and I also want to thank the Hanrai organizers for their kind invitation to participate in, in this round table. Uh, in Spain, the Control Health Care Associated infections is undertaken by specialized medical physicians and nurses in the preventive service units. And what has happened uh, during the pandemic is that the resources are limited and as many, uh, as many other places, 
during the last year, our attention and time has been heavily involved in pandemic control efforts. And it is true that we see right now a resurgence in AMR in our hospitals that can be related to some of the factors that have been mentioned before. Uh, however, I'm also uh, optimistic. I, I think that uh, on one hand, uh, the pandemic has given a great visibility to the IPC units uh, in our country and in general to IPC activities. Uh, as it has also been mentioned, uh, IPC activities are essential for AMR control. And so uh, right now, uh, it is clear that, that they that they are assumed as a very important and very essential part of all, all the uh, clinical activities that we, that we conduct in the hospitals. So I'm optimistic and I believe that the pandemic uh, has shown clearly the importance of investing suffi sufficiently in infection control and prevention in the future. And I do expect that uh, we will be in a much better situation to address AMR issues, uh, even though, as, uh, as I mentioned also, we are right now going through a difficult time. But in terms of infection control, uh, in general, I think IPC units will be much better placed to, to play the role that they have to. Uh, I, and in fact, a few changes have already, are already happening in this direction in, in our country. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, next question is for Yamadis Plahuras from ECDC. In EU Jamrai, the relationship between AMR and healthcare associated infection was one of the top priorities. IPC should go hand in hand with prudent use of antibiotics, appropriate tools for monitoring and surveillance, and accurate diagnostic tests to decide on the right therapy. Yamadis, do you think that we who work in the AMR and APC areas have done enough to communicate on the correlation between IPC and the AMR? How can ECDC help raise awareness uh, in this relationship? Thank you, Mariana. I mean, okay, IPC is a key for, for the prevention of spread of resistance. I mean, it's not the only objective of IPC, but it is one of the key, key objectives. And this is a message that everyone who is working with IPC has been really trying very hard to disseminate. And uh, it is true that often the focus is on antibiotic consumption, and this is also without doubt equally essential. But we must strive to make sure that IPC and the antibiotic stewardship complement each other. And this is why we think it is important that these that there is a very close collaboration between IPC and, and stewardship, because controlling AMR is one very important common objective. Now, is CDC uh, one of the main objectives uh, and one of the main targets of CDC is to increase awareness on the importance of infection prevention and control for the uh, uh, control of uh, antimicrobial resistance. And from the beginning, both AMR and infection prevention and control have been considered complementary and actually are part of the same program uh, at, uh, at the CDC. Uh, we have coordinated uh, already two point prevalence surveys uh, across Europe uh, on uh, healthcare associated infections and antimicrobial use, both in acute care hospitals and there are also two in uh, long-term care facilities. And in the latest uh, point prevalence survey, there was a very strong focus on uh, uh, structure and process indicators of, for uh, infection prevention and control. Now, one of the main objectives uh, of the PPS is to increase awareness among policy makers and professional. And the next uh, point prevalence survey is already planned for uh, 2022 in acute care hospitals and uh, for 2023 in long-term care facilities. Um, we definitely must do our best to make sure that the results and conclusions of these studies uh, reach their target and are actionable. Thank you. Thank you, Diamantis. Uh, we all know that compliance to uh, guidelines for healthcare associated prevention need to be increased in several areas. In UGMRI, we have seen the importance of structural implementation using an implementation framework and as a result made significant achievement with regards to catheter associated urinary tract infection. This question goes to uh, Mr. Uh, Anders. What could or should be done at an EU level to improve the implementation of guidelines for healthcare associated infection prevention? And how could the UK group support this effort? 
Thank you for the question. Uh, I think, you know, the implementation process is, is one of the most difficult parts and it's extremely complex as you have explained in your, in your work uh, in Jamrang. And I, I believe that uh, it's very hard to, to answer this simple. It will depend on so many factors, uh, be, even between countries within your, Europe. For, for, as an example, I mean, the culture, the way of work, and the way healthcare is organized in different countries will affect uh, what is the most effective way of implementing guidelines. So starting with, with that sort of, I think what, what is one, one very, very important, probably the most important uh, thing we believe in, in UKIC is to provide uh, improved education. So, so improve education and not only on a, a fairly simple level uh, about uh, hand hygiene pr practices, for instance, that's extremely important and must be implemented, but we need to educate the, the, the professions working in healthcare and all professions working in healthcare, not only specialists in, in infection. I mean, all professions working in healthcare, it's nurses, it's pharmacists, it's, it's physiotherapists, it's, it's, it's of course doctors, and, and all professions need a, a really high level education in, in IPC. I think that's, that's needed for implementation, successful implementation of, of guidelines. And UKIC, which is a, a part of, of ESCME, the European Society of Clinical Microbiology and Infection, Con and, and infectious diseases uh, is, is striving towards this, to improve education at the European level. Uh, it's, it's one of our major goals. And, and through this education at a high level, at the university level education, I'm talking, that's what we strive at, uh, to, to, to disseminate this, uh, this level of knowledge will improve implementation of guidelines. And I think that at the EU level, that's, uh, probably the most important thing is to provide educational tools at a high, high uh, level in, uh, to, peop to get uh, people broadly understand these complicated questions. And of course, research uh, and, and guidelines uh, are extremely important, but to really uh, reach uh, the major goal of implementation, we need uh, dissemination of knowledge. And I think organizing then these programs of education is key. Uh, and uh, we in UKIC, uh, we have uh, made the first round of the UKIC Infection Prevention and Control Certificate, which is one of these kind of educations I'm talking about, uh, a high level, university level educational uh, program. And uh, we will do this one more time now uh, and we are we are in the process of, of exam examination of the first round and we will con continue to strive these uh, uh, the, this work to to proceed this but I think this needs to be expanded this educational efforts I, I see that at the most important part to develop at the European level to then uh, implement guidelines because knowledge is needed to get that done. Thank you. Thank you, Anders. Uh, our results show that the significant percentage of healthcare workers do not consider themselves trained adequately so as to implement precautions measures. Therefore, we recommend that the basic IPC precautions measures should be established in the curriculum at an EU level in accordance with the IPC competencies, such as Anders also stated. Bear, what could, could or should be done at an EU level to improve the training of healthcare workers for healthcare associated infection prevention? How could ESMO assist in this effort? Thank you for the question, uh, Mariana. Um, if we talk about the European, it's just a very big continent. And it's, it's very, very big to, to think in broad perspective, what should the EU do? Because at the end, uh, it has to come at ward level, at, you know, at, 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 um, 
at that hosp at hospital level, it has to come to the to the responsible um, officers in, uh, in in health institutes to invest in in nurses uh, in, in 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 nurses. So sorry, I'm. I'm speaking a bit towards the nurses, but they also need to be facilitated. Often we think nurses just uh, make uh, make their work effective and just uh, uh, over history we have seen a lot of cutting of education, harm, uh, education, training, just do your job. And um, the recognition of, of, of nurses has been an, uh, under increase and uh, uh, under uh, uh, under pressure, and we have seen uh, all, all about this on the intensive care intensive care nurses. What happened? So, uh, in the COVID, we saw everyone is doing a bit what they have. We they had lack of uh, protection, but they also didn't know what was happening. Everyone uh, was at that was at that same. So it's very hard to to address this from EU level. Although the awareness on this topic really um, would uh, would uh, would support or, uh, organizations. You see, um, it's also it's not only about uh, knowledge, and uh, I, I really appreciate the, uh, the the comments of uh, of, of, of Anders uh, that, that we really should uh, invest in education, but also how to communicate. Everyone knew there was something going on, but with, with with as far as but how to communicate. So we. Uh, 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 we, we did see a lot. So hand washing. What is what, what is soap? What is uh, what are the disinfectants? So we we need to we, uh, we need to facilitate um, the healthcare professionals more on detail because um, say what well, do hand washing is not enough when you do not have soap. So this is why why I think uh, and at as EU level we should be more focused on this. So and if you think um, on the micro, always connect to the uh, uh, macro, but always connect to the to the mic, uh, micro levels. Um, and what we with ESNO uh, are really doing, uh, well, in two weeks' time we have a congress uh, and we have these topics also in the sessions on uh, infection prevention con uh, con control. And as, as I explained le later, yeah, I'm just I'm very bit proud on the on our uh, nurses guide. Is it's uh, it's an information and communication uh, guide for nurses, and it's this very in depth um, information. Um, what are the microbes and how to and what are the dynamics? What what are the mechanisms? So it's not only enough to say, well, do this, do that, but so just just make them engage, uh, have them participate because then they're really becoming your advocates for the uh, for uh, for the for the for the mission at the end also to uh, to a to to, to AM, AMR. Thank you. Um, next question. In a healthcare setting, the key for an effective IPC program's implementation is to change the behavioral culture. Hierarchy's role, the support of the administration, and effective collaboration and communication process are some of the factors that improve the culture. Alberto, from a healthcare worker perspective, do you have concrete examples on how to improve behavioral culture? What activities can have a, pos can have a positive impact on the culture of the healthcare setting? Thank you for the question, uh, Mariana. Uh, addressing the behavioral culture, as you mentioned, is a crucial issue. Uh, I work at the tertiary hospital. Um, behavioral culture is also specific to each particular work niche in the hospital. Uh, we have to be aware that sometimes in a large institution, we may have different units, may have even different behavioral cultures, and we have to address them uh, specifically. Now, in order to address behavioral culture, uh, basically we need to convince and motivate health professionals to abandon old practices and incorporate new ones. Uh, therefore, we need to provide information and arguments uh, so that professionals understand why things should be improved. Because improving basically means uh, to, to do things differently to the way they have been done in the past. So I can give you some examples that related to prevention of surgical infection uh, that we do by incorporating bundles that are uh, evident, evidence based and also improve uh, hand hygiene practices, both in terms of frequency and quality of the practice. Now, what we do to increase awareness and motivation and uh, have a positive impact, uh, we use specific surveillance uh, data we have from their units to inform them what is happening to their patients in terms of AMR and infection. So the first we do is we uh, start, we project them, we pr project what they are doing, basically, what are the practices they are doing 
and we show them like uh, the reflection in the mirror. Uh, so we show them what they are doing, not, not the things that they, they believe they are doing. And obviously, that often they are very, very different. Uh, now, once they have that, they know exactly what is happening, uh, we provide them a, a link also between those practices and the transmission of infection in, in their patients. So we use evidence-based experience from uh, international and national experience, and we show them what is the relationship between that. And then uh, we invest a lot of time in terms of training activities to explain all the above mechanisms of transmission, IPC strategies that they can develop. And in the end, uh, basically is to try to build trust and create a partnership with health professionals around the common goal and then work together uh, to achieve that. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto. Uh, we had one more question, but uh, due to delay, uh, we will skip it to be able to ask you some question from the audience. So, so we got two questions from the audience. So one first question is for Andres or Diamantis or Boss. Uh, and the question and is what could be improved to make healthcare associated infection uh, surg surgical seat infection more transparent looking uh, when we look at delay of publication of data? Just a really quick answer, please. Uh, ben benchmarking, I think, is if Anders start here. Benchmarking, I think, is a, is a way to move forward, to be open with data and try to compete a little uh, between different parts in a friendly way, but still show our data fast. Yes, thank you. Uh, that, that's a very, a very good question. I think it's very important to be transparent and to, to be ready to, to share the data and to be ready to have this data open to, to the public. Um, of course, it is not very easy. It depends a lot on, on the culture, but I think that we need to work towards this, uh, this uh, aim. Well, thank you. I think we have time for one more question from the audience, but also really, really quick answer, please. Uh, how can we make sure the compliance of uh, the compliance to uh, infection control and prevention in hospital uh, with physicians? How, how to make people comply with guidelines? I think it's a, it's a really a one million question again. Alberto? Okay. If I just say something from you, Kik, I think one important thing is to engage the public. If the public is engaged in, in the behavior of healthcare workers, then the healthcare will change their behavior because of the pressure from the public. Yeah, and no, I think just speaking out, if you see, just speak out and don't be, uh, because sometimes these. Uh, Infection sometimes relates to shame. So, now, oh my God, what have I done? Just, uh, just be transparent, and also about the guidelines. You're not following the guidelines. Go back and wash your hands. Then you can 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 come in. So it's more um, so it's, you work. You, you you do this for patient safety. Yeah, I would say surveillance data. We need surveillance. We need to monitor what is happening and provide feedback to health professionals about what they are doing. Sometimes the, the, the view we have is very distorted. Many, many thanks. I'm going to do the timekeeper as a master of ceremony. So I'll let thank you conclude quickly. Yes, thank you all for Thank you all for your time and for participating in this round table. We were really happy to, to, to share your insight on those questions. And hopefully uh, IPC will gain uh, more, um, more importance uh, in the political agenda because it's a, it's a really important matter. Thank you all and uh, Marielle, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. So let's meet after the break at 10.35. See you.
Last but not least, we'll be focusing on boosting innovation and ensuring availability of existing antibiotics. Please welcome Christine Ardell, working at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health and co-lead of the Work Package 9. Christine, the floor is yours, but first we're going to look at a video on research and innovation. With the help of seven voluntary countries, EU JAMRAI performed a mapping of European research priorities and gaps on antimicrobial resistance. Results highlight the current European priorities. All participating countries consider that fundamental research on AMR and strengthening surveillance are priorities. Six out of seven define as priority the assessment of best practices and strategies for antibiotic stewardship and five out of seven consider that the development of antibiotics alternatives to antibiotics or diagnostics is also a pressing matter. The three critical gaps identified by this mapping effort include a lack of research in the environmental field, in the food safety area and on how to improve clinical trials for antimicrobials. While not being as alarming as these three gaps, there is a fourth gap of great concern, the lack of research in the field of infection prevention and control. As a part of our work in EEU JAMRAI, looking at research and innovation, we looked at existing global research agendas in order to see that they matched up with the priorities of national action plans and their uh, priorities for research. We found that infection prevention and control was often missing in the, national, in the global research agendas. And IPC is such a critical part and needs its research. Um, IPC may not be considered sexy, it's talking about hand washing and other things, but as we've seen with COVID-19, uh, IPC is, an, is a very important part in order to control infections and AMR. If we can uh, have less infections, then we have less resistant infections. People need to realize the importance of IPC and our research in the field. IPC goes well beyond hand washing. Often IPC is our last resource when we don't have effective treatment for infection. So last resort to prevent the spread of infection. I think the COVID-19 crisis highlighted that well. IPC must be at the cornerstone of any healthcare system. For instance, purchase of sink must be informed by evidence, evidence on how likely people are going to use them and evidence on how to disinfect them. That's why we need research in the field because guidelines and evidence are still lacking. When IPC research projects compete for funding against other thematic areas such as breakthrough technologies to combat climate change, big data against social inequities, or potential new cancer treatments, they are often perceived as dull, receiving low innovation marks. EU JAMRAI has developed a list of IPC research priorities covering gaps in the field. This list was built from a literature review validated by two groups of experts, published on an international journal and widely disseminated through EU JAMRAI network. Now we have identified these knowledge gaps, we need to include them in research agendas and ensure that the necessary resources can be committed to fill them. In other words, what we want is facilitate the appropriation of these research gaps and aware policymakers about the need to finance invention prevention and control research. Antibiotic resistance imperils global health. New antibiotics, alternatives, diagnostics and strategies to combat AMR are necessary. Yet contrary to this public health need, antibiotic innovators and manufacturers are struggling. Physicians use new antibiotics as last resort to preserve their efficacy. Whereas this is sound stewardship, it also disincentivizes innovation since for company revenues come from unit sales. As a result, 
large pharmaceutical companies are leaving the field because the market is inattractive. Today, antibiotic innovation only rely on SMEs, who are also failing to cover their development costs. During the last two years, three SMEs developing antibiotics went bankrupt. This shows that today the antibiotic market is not safe and is unpredictable. Simultaneously, shortages of older antibiotics are increasing. This problem has been exacerbated during the COVID-19 pandemic. Supply chains have been unable to meet demand as well as challenged by supply disruptions due to lockdowns and border closures. One of the aspects of EU Jamrai that we're very pleased with is that we've had the opportunity to talk with policymakers about their perspectives on novel reimbursement mechanisms to stimulate antibiotic innovation. And policymakers have come with a very clear message. They want access to antibiotics for the right patient at the right time. It doesn't matter if it's an old antibiotic or a new antibiotic. They want access so that the patients can have the right antibiotic. Uh, new antibiotics need to have better clinical evidence to understand where they can be used. Um, but the older antibiotics, we have a huge problem with shortages. This has been a problem before COVID. It's still a problem during COVID. Uh, one area that we've been calling for is greater transparency in the supply chain so we can understand which of these older antibiotics actually have vulnerable supply and we can work on measures uh, to make them more robust. But first, we have to know which older antibiotics are in jeopardy. Several prominent reports have assessed the challenges to antibiotic access and innovation and included pool incentives in the recommendations. The objective of these incentives is increasing revenues for marketed innovative antibiotics. To understand countries' perceptions of these recommendations, EU Jamrai performed in-depth interviews with policymakers and AMR experts in 10 European countries and three more countries from other continents, thanks to the support of Global AMR Research and Development Hub. The aim of the interviews was to understand the barriers and facilitators for implementing incentives through frank and anonymous dialogue. While 11 countries expressed general support for antibiotic incentives, almost all are uncertain which incentive is appropriate for their country, how to implement an incentive and how much it will cost. They prefer a pan-European pool incentive rather than setting up their own national solutions. So, there is a clear need for specific, detailed incentives that national policymakers can assess, tailor, and implement to ensure access to important antibiotics that meet public health needs. Excellent. Thank you so much and welcome to Research and Innovation. Um, so I'm going to take you through just a brief presentation here and then we'll go over to the esteemed panel. So uh, I wanted to focus on one aspect of our work and that's pull incentives. Um, pull, uh, okay. Sorry, uh, my... Oh, okay, there. Um, uh, so what exactly is a pull incentive? Um, a pull incentive uh, aims to um, increase or to improve the market conditions. So the, the real point of a pull incentive is we want to make sure that we have attractive markets for companies to make sure that we have continued access to these important uh, antibiotics. Now, often when we talk about pull incentives, um, we're talking about delinked pull incentive. And delinkage basically means that the revenues shouldn't be tied to how much of the antibiotic is sold. Uh, in our work on the EU JAMRI, we've looked at uh, European strategies to implement pull incentives. Um, and why, why are we talking about pull incentives here? So there's been a worrying trend of delayed availability for new antibiotics in Europe. And I want to take you through two specific cases. So the first case is uh, Meropenem babarbactam. 
This is a, um, an antibiotic approved by the FDA in the US in 2017, um, and shortly thereafter launched in the American market. Um, it was approved by the EMA in November 2018. It targets a WHO critical priority pathogen, uh, CRE, um, and what that means is that uh, this is an an a pathogen that really needs new antibiotics critically. Uh, Meropenem vabrobactam is considered innovative by the WHO, uh, and it's made by a medium-sized American company. Unfortunately, they went bankrupt in 2019, so they're under restructuring now. Um, but even though this antibiotic has been uh, was approved over two years ago, it's actually only available in a handful of European countries. The next case is Tanaborbactam cefepim. This also targets WHO critical priority pathogen, again, CRE, and it's also considered innovative by the WHO, although this antibiotic is not yet approved. It's in phase three clinical trials. Again, this is a small American company, and interestingly, um, they have pursued licensing agreements, uh, two licensing agreements. So the first was in 2018 um, with a Chinese company uh, to license and to uh, give access to China, South Korea, and Southeast Asia. And the second licensing ag agreement is through the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership in 2020, which will give access to low and lower middle income countries, which is great to see that these countries will have access to a new antibiotic. But as of yet, there's no European commercialization partner, which can mean delayed access if the antibiotic is approved. Um, and the reason for this is that the European market is considered less attractive uh, due to low sales and low prices, as we mentioned in the video. Um, so it was really good news to see in the pharmaceutical strategy for Europe that was launched in uh, November 2020 um, that uh, where the EU commits to provide pull incentives for novel antimicrobials um, with a target date of implementing this year. This was great news. Um, and it's also good news that there's, we have evidence to draw upon uh, from the implementation of two pull incentives in two European countries. So the first is uh, the UK has launched a pull incentive in England. It's a fully delinked pull incentive. Apologies, this slide's a little bit busy. Um, but uh, basically, the UK has selected two antibiotics on the right-hand side, um, and they are in the process of developing the value for those antibiotics. They're performing health technology assessments where they're including not only patient value, but also societal value. And societal value means that they're taking into account um, aspects like transmission and how these antibiotics can reduce transmission um, within English society. There's a maximum uh, amount of 10 million pounds per year per antibiotic that uh, will be paid out through this incentive. Um, and uh, this is in the process of being implemented. The second um, pull mechanism is in Sweden. This is a partially delinked pull mechanism where they've guaranteed an annual revenue. So basically the processes of pricing, procurement and reimbursement continue as per normal. Um, and at the end of the year, they find out how much of the antibiotic has been sold. If um, there's a guarantee, there's a guarantee of, of 4 million Swedish kroner. So if the antibiotic uh, hasn't sold more than that, that uh, the remainder or the difference will be, top, uh, will be paid to the company. And if it's gone over the 4 million mark, then uh, the company keeps, of course, the excess amount and also receives a 10% bonus. So five antibiotics have been included in this. Uh, all have been newly marketed in Sweden. Um, through EU JAMRAI, as we said, we wanted to, to gather uh, European policymakers' perspectives, and we were really thrilled that the global AMR R&D hub was willing to work with us and enabled us to talk as well to Canada, Japan, and South Africa. And the findings really show that there is interest in pull incentives amongst countries. 11 of the 13 countries expressed support for the new incentives, but this was really high level general support. Um, there's still uh, some confusion and maybe a lack of understanding about the details of pull incentives, you know, which incentives works best for each country, what antibiotics should be included, how much will it cost, and so on. 
Um, and because of this, this uncertainty, 11 of the 13 countries said that they would prefer a common multinational incentive. It doesn't ne necessarily could be through the European Commission, but it could be through another organization as well. But it needs to be independent of national medicine pricing, procurement, and reimbursement processes. I'm sure, as you all agree, these processes are very complex and heterogeneous, and really countries aren't looking to disrupt them with antibiotics that they really don't expect to use very much. Um, at the same time, 12 of the 13 countries indicated that shortages of existing antibiotics are a serious problem nationally. And eight of these countries said that this resulted in a greater use of broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, and because of this reason, um, really nine of the 11 countries are looking for pull incentives that can work with both old and new antibiotics, often with the highest priority given to older antibiotics. They wanna make sure that they have sustainable access to high value, low value, low volume uh, antibiotics. So uh, since the, the EU is looking at pull mechanisms and we have all of this uh, evidence, we thought, or sorry, one, one point before, um, one important point about um, incentives is the clinical evidence. Um, and it's really important that the new antibiotics demonstrate where they can be used. One country said, antibiotics are being approved for indications where there's no intention that they will be used. This sends the wrong signal. Uh, this country would prefer that antibiotics are tested against drug resistance instead. If the trials need to be done in countries with higher levels of antibiotic resistance and they are performed according to existing standards, this is preferable. So based on this evidence, we thought that we could uh, utilize this to come up with a proposal for an annual reven revenue guarantee using Sweden as a basis. Uh, and our idea is as follows. So the, it starts with national and regional reg regulators um, assessing the new antibiotics and really identifying those that meet unmet public health need. At the same time, countries are able to, to tell, um, to add in which important antibiotics have vulnerable supply in their country and those which they really wanna see a better and stronger supply. This could be fed into a coordinator that really works to facilitate um, the process. And the coordinator would develop a joint tender description and a draft contract for a revenue guarantee. This would then, uh, countries could opt in and producers, antibiotic producers could opt in or opt out. It's purely voluntary. And once this process has been facilitated, the producers and the national governments would negotiate individual contracts amongst them. So the idea here is that the coordinator would facilitate the multinational pull mechanism, making it really easy for countries and producers to opt in, but that yet the control and the negotiation resides between the countries and the producers. This could work for old and new antibiotics, all antibiotics with high value and low volume. So with this presentation, I will turn it over to the panel. First, I'd like to say thank you to everyone, all of our partners in EU JAMRAI, and especially Marie-Cécile Ploy and Johan Lacotte. Thank you. So now I'm pleased to introduce um, our esteemed panel. Uh, we have Alexandra Opolska, who's the policy officer for DG Sante at the European Commission. Antonio Lopez Navas, who's the deputy head of human medicines department at the Spanish Agency for Medicines. Momar Radulovic, who's the executive director at the Slovenian Medicines Agency. Marco Cavallari, head of biological health threats and vaccine strategy, European Medicines Agency. And Suzanne Edwards, program officer economist at the global AMR R&D hub. Thank you so much for taking time to join us. I know you're all extremely busy, so I appreciate it. Uh, so I think just to kick off, um, maybe we, we can throw the first question at Alexandra. Alexandra, we're all super excited about the EU pull mechanism. Can you tell us a, a little bit about the forthcoming process? Maybe now I try again. Perfect. Yeah. Good morning to everybody and thank you for having me um, today. Um, and thank you also for sharing your proposal, uh, which is very interesting for us. Um, so let me let me answer your question. 
um, of course, and uh, I think you, you also mentioned pharmaceutical strategy, it is obvious that for the Commission, we recognize the challenge um, with pool incentives and with the pharmaceutical business model. Um, so, of course, uh, we have some flagship uh, initiatives within the pharmaceutical strategy. Uh, and uh, of course, as a part also uh, of the new health emergency response uh, authority, we will uh, pilot this project. Um, where the project will be developed and tested for innovative approaches to R&D and public mm -hmm. procurement for antimicrobials and their alternatives, because uh, we see that technology and medicine in medicine area goes so fast that uh, maybe some bright uh, scientists will uh, invent uh, new alternatives for antibiotics or other antimicrobials. So those pilots uh, will recognize that intervention at single points uh, of development will not be sufficient, uh, but that we have to connect the whole dots between uh, the research and bringing products um, to the market. And the pilot will be uh, created with a close collaboration uh, with member states as they are going to be key players. Um, and uh, of course, AUMR could become the next global health threats crisis, and we need to be prepared. That is also why uh, we would like to have the lesson learned from um, the ongoing pandemic. Uh, and uh, we, we can use the additional information uh, how to handle this kind of public health uh, threats that affect the whole world, um, the same as AUMR actually. Um, so we are confronted with the situation when where we have uh, limited therapeutic uh, options, um, and um, we we see the race uh, to develop new treatments and uh, vaccines. And this extraordinary situation actually has resulted in new ways of bringing institutions, pharmaceutical companies, governments, and academia together. Um, so the models uh, used during the current pandemic. Um, to boost and support the speedy development of COVID-19 vaccines may also inform the discussion on how to support the development uh, of new antimicrobials. Um, and uh, in, the, um, in that sense, this may also uh, maybe uh, give us, um, uh, um, well, um, if, well, if you allow me to say that, uh, it might be a positive aspect of the crisis um, that uh, it may show us the new leads uh, of collaborative efforts that could later be unconsidered for other problems such as uh, AUMR. Thank you, Alexandra. Marco, if we can turn in and talk a little bit about the regulatory, do you think it's, it's realistic to think that clinical trials can be performed that demonstrate superiority and, and what needs to happen to make this change, if it's possible? Yeah, we've been discussing this topic since many years now, and I see that it's still uh, still there as an important one. Uh, of course, with the with the whole desire to see that new antibiotics really show superiority to the old one in terms of uh, clinical outcome and clinical endpoint, and taking into account that indeed with multi-drug resistant organism, uh, old antibiotic may fail in curing certain type of infection. The problem is that, as we've seen many times, that these studies are really difficult to conduct because if indeed the, the efficacy of the old antibiotic, you know already upfront that is not there, well, you cannot ethically run such trials and you have to think into going into a comparison of combination therapy that at the end of the day will make this uh, comparison extremely complicated. And what we're seeing is that it's not always easy even when you can or you are close to a situation in which you could demonstrate a superiority than to actually do so. So I think, uh, and we have said this since many years now, that we need to explore other ways of showing what is the added benefit of new antibiotics, starting from what we know from microbiology and uh, what is called pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamics, as this would be the good starting point to really understand what is the value of new, uh, of new agents that might be brought up uh, in the meanwhile and could cope very well with, uh, with emerging resistance. So without the need really of demonstrating these into clinical trials. 
so we really hope that we can we can continue down this route because we see that uh, it's extremely problematic to demand that only antibiotics that show clinical superiority then would be uh, amenable to have some kind of reward. So uh, this this we already know. We already tested several times, and we really need to think out of the box into how we can do in other ways, but still maintaining a good control of what really is adding value versus what is not. Thank you, Marco. That, that's very good, very clear. If we can turn it over to um, the countries now, uh, Antonio and Momir, um, do you, you've heard now about the, the European uh, pull incentive that Alexandra discussed. Do you think that the, the pull incentive suggestions that we, we propose now could be useful in the context of Slovenia and Spain? Maybe we can start with Momir. Uh, thank you for the invitation to participate in this uh, final dissemination conference and uh, I would really like to congratulate you for your work. I agree that the incentives for uh, antibiotics are necessary and we also opt for European or multinational incentives because those have better chances in my view to come to the sustainable solutions in antibiotic related uh, innovation. And I would just like to add the perspective of the small member states. Uh, so markets in the EU are diverse, but Slovenia is a very small market for medicines and as such, we are really additionally vulnerable to drug shortages and here is a general challenge to, uh, to see what can or should be done differently at the EU legislative framework that would help us to uh, improving availability of medicines uh, throughout the EU. Uh, we all know that antibiotics are kind of specific products and some antibiotics will never uh, enter the Slovenia in a regular way. So we see incentives as uh, piloted in Sweden, Germany or UK, as well as suggestions that have been made from this joint uh, action are much welcome for any national reflections. But even more, in, uh, it is important in my uh, view, the potential of your results to stimulate the EU level uh, solutions. So uh, I think the work of you, Jamra, can inform such efforts and stimulate uh, further reflections. And we have pharmaceutical strategy, we have announced HERA, and I think this is a promising momentum for alternative EU level model covering the whole life cycle of the product. Thank you very much. Antonio? Oh, good morning to everyone. Uh, first, I would like to thank you for the invitation and congratulations for the work done in the EU jump right. And now answering to your question, um, a particularity of our country is that uh, whereas the decision of pricing and reimbursement relies on the central government, uh, the payers, uh, that is the budget, depend on the, uh, depend on the autonomous regions. Uh, that implies that sometimes it's very difficult to align the priorities between the central governments and the regions, uh, but definitely, yes, uh, with a strong uh, leadership and coordination, the pool inceptive model that the EU Jambra is proposing could be perfectly applicable for the EU and, and in Spain. Uh, we have the recent experience uh, for the development of COVID vaccines. We have seen uh, that this close collaboration between countries, the EU coordination, a centralized assessment, having clear criteria for eligibility of promising vaccines, that sharing the risk between companies, countries, uh, EU member states and the European Union in the development and manufacturing have worked. So this strong coordination has ensured the access and guaranteeing the revenues for companies. Other thing is when we are speaking about the old antibiotics and uh, how to ensure its availability, I think that uh, a key point of the model that you are proposing is the sustainability. This is already proposed by the Drive IB project. Um, it's a key criteria for us, it's a key criteria for market entry rewards, uh, meaning that we, um, there should be obligations on sustainable use and access uh, that should remain for the lifetime of the antibiotic, not subject to any budget changes. Finally, um, your survey uh, highlighted something very important, uh, uh, that is the policymakers usually find the evidence for clinical trials lacking of real added value from many medical needs. Mark already expressed how the EU and the EMA is working on this in this field, but 
Uh, for example, in Spain, we started the project last year. We created an electronic system for collecting real world data for antibiotics to establish this added value for critically important antibiotics. Uh, it, if it works, it will allow us to reevaluate uh, its import in a real world uh, use, and it will open the possibility uh, of increasing the, re the revenue in those cases where this added value is finally demonstrated. Thank you, Antonia. That was very interesting. Suzanne, um, do you, um, as your role through the Global AMR R&D Hub, um, do you think that the, the hub could take on the role of the coordinator uh, in our proposed model? Thanks, Christine. Uh, you're never one to shy from a, a big question. <laughs> um, I mean, cert certainly, um, uh, if we were to move from the general support that your study demonstrates actually into implementation, of course, that would be absolutely wonderful. Um, I think at the global level, which is sort of where we sit 2021 is, is going to see uh, there are some shifts in, I think, how the global response is going to be governed moving forward. So that, that's one to watch, I think, from the position of the hub itself. Um, we were originally set up with a three-year mandate, which is coming to an end at the end of this year. Um, and the board is currently beginning those conversations as to what shape the hub will take moving forward. So um, I can certainly say that now is certainly the time to bring forward those proposals, and I would encourage you to do so. Thank you for the tip. <laughs> It just, a, I think, a reflection on, on Antonio's point about real-world data, um, and and maybe back to Marco. Is there is there any way that the EMA is looking at gathering this type of real-world data? And also, I know that you've been doing a lot of work um, in combination with uh, the Indian Medicines Agency and the American Medicines Agency. Is there is there some sort of synergies as well that could could provide maybe maybe not superiority trials, but at least the stronger evidence that would be useful to countries? Yeah, I think uh, building on what Antonio said, which I think it, it's a great initiative in Spain, I think uh, we need to make use of all these different tools which have been underutilized so far in order to see if we can gather there really good evidence that would uh, additionally support what could be the added value of certain antibiotics in certain conditions and against certain pathogens. So definitely I see there room for improving. And as you know, the EMA uh, together with the European Commission is, is uh, really launching a number of big initiatives on the collection of real world evidence across the continent, uh, trying also to get via database that might communicate one to the other. So not really limited to one country or region because of course, we do recognize that with this kind of data, you need to go big, you need, you need to be broad, you, you cannot just stay in, into a single region or country. And therefore, it's so important <clears throat> that these efforts are, are moved on and uh, we can see what comes out of that. One of the, the big issues that we've seen when we license new antibiotics that potentially have an effect against multidrug resistant strains is that they are used really as second life for line on cases that are kind of desperate in many, many situations. And, and that's why, you know, some of the early data that we've seen are not telling us a lot because uh, they might be used with really sick patients when you don't have really a lot of chances of seeing, of seeing what is the benefit. So also a word of caution here on how to use real world evidence in this context, but nevertheless, definitely an area that deserves to be explored more. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, we have a question um, from the audience about linking incentives between diagnostics and antibiotics. Uh, do you think it's a good way forward to promote stewardship? Um, maybe we could hear the Slovenian perspective about using diagnostics. Uh, well, so the question is in what term of diagnostics? You mean the R&D, like repurposing, or uh in the way of, of just uh, general diagnosis of antibiotic infections um is it uh, basically to to incentivize the use of diagnostics um in order to to decide which antibiotics uh, the patient should receive if if he or she should receive well definitely slovenia supports that you know, because we i think we all should have national policies in place to have uh for instance in otitis media the first choice of antibiotic we sometimes we have 
overused by uh, healthcare practitioners that are trying with the second or third line therapy in the very beginning. So I think we should all should stick to the uh, strict national guidelines or maybe even European guidelines here, because in order uh, to do that, we will then avoid AMR in the long term. Uh, a question to Alexandra from the audience. Uh, they'd like to know how, how they can get more involved in the uh, pull incentive. By they, you mean uh, who? Sorry, I can't see a name. <laughs> I would just, uh, well, maybe the question is for for, uh, for national for people who uh, national representatives versus uh, people who, who don't directly work with the government. Well, I think the member states, as I said, they will be closely involved in creation of this pilot, uh, as it will have some elements of the procurement. Uh, if the uh, audience is a pharmaceutical industry, but or academia, then we'll have to see further uh, later on how um, also um, industry can be involved. Of course, they are very important stakeholders, so we will take into consideration uh, their opinion. Uh, and uh, we had already several, um, as Mark also said, we've been talking about pull incentives for several years, so we know um, the opinion of, uh, of stakeholders. But I think there will be opportunity also for, uh, for pharmaceutical industry, for SMEs and academia to, to uh, present their views. Many, many thanks. Time for me to do some timekeeping. So let's go to conclusion, please. Thank you very much to everyone for, for taking time to participate in this panel. Apologies, uh, we ran a little bit short of time, but thank you very much for, for taking time to be here. And um, if there's any other audience members that didn't have a chance to answer their questions, uh, please get in touch with me. Thank you. Thank you all, sorry for this uh, timekeeping, but uh, now we're going to watch a short announcement on handing over the beginning. Thank you. EU Jamrise Legacy is a new beginning in the fight against antimicrobial resistance. We are delivering concrete measures with demonstrated potential to tackle this global health threat. We are handing over tools, thoughts, reflections and methods to take Europe forward. The next step is a renewed commitment from all member states and relevant actors to keep AMR reduction high on the agenda. And this is what we want to see, the fruits of the joint action coming, being transplanted across Europe, growing and regrowing and transplanting and spreading out a culture of good practice which will enable Europe to become a best practice region and make it really safe for Europeans to go into their hospitals, to go into their fields, to go into their general practices and their schools and so on and not be in fear of catching a highly resistant infection. Yes, EMR reduction is a considerable challenge but feasible if all actors take concrete actions. We are accountable to the younger generations of the measures we take now. So we cannot afford to work in silo. We cannot afford to stop our efforts. We have all to continue our collective effort at national, European and international level. I will give the floor to Professor Tessini. Professor Tessini is a work package for leader, integration, international policy, and sustainability. Please. Many thanks. <laughs> Can you hear me? Perfectly. Yes. So um, my task is actually to summarize the key points I heard during um, the conference, and it was very, very interesting. So I will probably give a biased view, but I will try to do highlight uh, the main points that were discussed during these two days. First, I, I think COVID has highlight highlighted the impact of untreatable infections 
and a completely resistant bacteria would be the same as COVID, untreatable infection. COVID ha has also uh, put uh, in the light, I would say, infection prevention and control, and it is a very good opportunity to improve practices in that area. On the other hand, it has been massively disruptive for antibiotic stewardship, so we need to be very careful to not to lose actually what we have gained with antibiotic stewardship in, in the next months. I think the EU JAMRAI Jam has bridged partially, but has tried to, to bridge a gap between declaration and actions, because the main problem uh, I've heard during these two days is really how to implement evidence-based uh, facts and recommendations. And that's really the problem we face uh, every day. Also, the EU, EU GEMRAI has brought together policymakers and a very wide range of stakeholders. And I think that's very important. And that's probably one of the main um, successes of the EU GEMRAI. Um, people were saying that it is very important to keep the network alive and to share best practices and also to adapt to local context. It was mentioned many, many times during these two days. There, is, there are lots of opportunities right now within the EU with lots of initiatives. Uh, I mean the EU for Health program, for example, or the pharmaceutical strategy. And Charles Price yesterday was mentioning that he would like to have more projects like JAMRAI, uh, thanks to the EU for Health program. Then, uh, if I go back to the AMR One Health Network, uh, the quiz showed that 84% of people wanted to, to use the network as a platform for exchange of good practices, which is, which is good news. And Andrea Gavinelli from BG Santé said that this will be discussed during the next meeting that is uh, upcoming. And also the concept of the network of supervisory bodies will be discussed at, at the next meeting, which is very good news for sustainability. Uh, he also mentioned that uh, there is uh, some thoughts regarding connections with civil society and professional organizations within the One Health Network. So we are really looking forward to seeing what will uh, be coming out from these thoughts. Regarding communication, it was really mentioned that it must be a cornerstone of any national action plan on antimicrobial resistance. And Danilo from WHO Euro said that a lot can be done with a little and maybe the tools that Jamrai has uh, produced, like the toolkits, like the symbol I am wearing, maybe they will be useful to kind of help doing lots of stuff with just a little resources. Danilo also said that we need to raise awareness all year round, not only one week per year. And I really think that's important uh, as, as a main goal. And he also said that COVID has shown that people can change behavior quite quickly, actually, if we use the, the good leverages. Regarding ERSVET, what I've heard is a very broad support uh, regarding this initiative, which is, which is good news as well, and that the animal health law might be the best opportunity to continue the work initiated by the JAMRAI. Regarding antibiotic stewardship and infection prevention and control, there are many, many common points regarding these two topics. What I've heard as well is that there is a need for core elements of infection prevention and control and also antibiotic stewardship programs at EU level. There is also a need to define core competencies for training of health professionals. And we need also to involve many different professionals, not only doctors, but also pharmacists, nurses, and probably many more, and also the patients, of course. I also heard that it's very important to take into account behavior change strategies and also implementation science. And so that needs to be included probably into these competencies. And I also heard from Sarah Wiener a very strong support for indicators and targets. And we discussed the advantages and also uh, the, the thought we need to put into indicators and targets, both at EU level, national level, and local level. Then regarding research, uh, JAMRA has produced, produced lots of resources to define research gaps, and we hope they will be uh, included into national and EU strategic agendas for research. And the last uh, panel was, was discussing innovation and access. I think what was really interesting is um, the fact that um, countries expressed lots of uncertainty regarding the best model, 
but they, there is an appetite expressed during uh, both the qualitative study but also during the panel discussion for a pilot at EU level and we are very happy that uh, the Commission is leading that work forward in the next months. Also very important I think is uh, the link that um, country representatives are making between old and new antibiotics. They want access to both and they probably want incentives and mechanisms uh, to, to maintain access to both. So, uh, final words, Marielle, you will be happy because I will finish a bit earlier than planned. I think uh, we need to build on the opportunities brought by the COVID crisis. Uh, I think Anders Johansson was saying uh, he, he prefers say, seeing opportunities rather than problems, and I think we should do that with, with COVID. There are lots of things that have changed and we need to build on uh, the, the opportunities that were highlighted during, during the crisis. I think the JAMRAI has produced a momentum and we need to build on this. We need to maintain the network. We need to continue sharing experiences and we need to work all together to tackle AMR in the next years because uh, it's the next crisis probably. And we are all aware we need to do more and, and quicker if we want to achieve uh, the objective of tackling AMR efficiently. Thank you very much, and I hand over to Marianne. Thank you, Professor Fulcini. So now I'm very glad to hand over to Professor Croix, EU JAMRAI coordinator at the French National Institute for Health and Medical Research. Professor Croix, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Marianne. Um, I first want to congratulate everyone and thank you warmly. We had two tremendous rocking days, and each day we have been around 300 people connected. Thank you for showing through the country to country visit how important and synergistic cooperation and coordination between member states are. We had the opportunity to see these two days that everyone is an actor that wants to play a role now and in the future to sustain the UJAMRI outcomes. The UJAMRI underlined how essential networking was to continue improving and sustaining this EU-wide collaboration between member states in the field of antimicrobial resistance. The UJAMRI has facilitated and improved the coordination between member states and with the relevant stakeholders and it has also promoted the development of exchanges of best practices in the EU, as well as their sustainability and integration into national policies. However, while achieving most of its objectives over the period, the UJAMRI identified several unmet needs that still need to be urgently, urgently addressed. If no effective public health action is reinforced and put in place in the coming years, AMR and its impact will undoubtedly grow further. The COVID pandemic has reminded us how important it is to work together, all member states, all professionals, all stakeholders in a One Health framework. Because we believe these unmet needs identified by the UJAMRI are critical issues that must be urgently addressed at the EU level, and given the results obtained so far, but also the existing momentum within the UJAMRI consortium, we are calling the Member States and the European Commission for a second joint action to continue the fight against antimicrobial resistance and healthcare associated infections. The UJAMRI has demonstrated that EU funding in support of member states and stakeholders is not only cost effective, but also efficient to implement the European Action Plan on AMR. Despite the current COVID crisis, AMR remains a top priority topic on the political and political agenda and this was said by, by Céline just before me and uh, in the panel discussion. And Emma was part of the President Ursula von der Leyen's mission letters to Stella Kyriakides, Commissioner for Health and Food Safety at the European Commission. A second European joint action on AMR 
would also be the adequate instrument to collectively address the 2070 EU One Action Plan against AMR and the 2019 conclusions of the EU Council on AMR. A second huge MRI could propose concrete steps enabling EU countries and beyond to further strengthen the implementation of efficient, evidence-based and sustainable policies to tackle AMR and healthcare-associated infections in line with the One Health perspective. With the huge MRI, we showed that the One Health approach is more than a concept and that it come true if we are all committed to the same direction. Without forgetting the environmental issue we did not address within the UJMI one. Indeed, the environment is at once an IMR reservoir and a potential transmission route. Now we are able to pursue this one earth strategy, in particular in link with the farm to fork overarching strategy the Green Deal requirement and the Just Transition deal. We are ready to work with you, member states and stakeholders, to build a surveillance system for real-time surveillance of IMR in a One Health approach. We are, ready, we are ready to work with you, member states and stakeholders, to ensure that the interoperable data, uh, data set from this surveillance can support One Health research activities and impact assessment of corresponding measures. We are ready to work with you, member states and stakeholders, to secure access to antibiotics, the existing and the new ones. We are ready to work with you, member states and stakeholders, to spur me prevention measures through dedicated research programs and in the frame of the EU for Health, the promotion of infection prevention and control as well as antimicrobial stewardship best practices. We are ready to work with you, member states and stakeholders, raising awareness on AMR through the promotion of the antibiotic resistance symbol. We are ready to work with you, member states and stakeholders, to extend and strengthen the mandate of the One Health Network with the support of a supervisory body network. And lastly, we are ready to work with you, member states and stakeholders, to assess the risk of AMR transmission from animals to humans and estimate the burden of AMR in animal health through the ERSVET network. This is feasible. We have shown that working together was synergistic and very inspiring. This can be achieved through the reinforcement of the existing networks with the support of member states in the implementation of their national strategy and the promotion at uh, EU level of a transsectoral and integrative approach. The European Joint Action on Antimicrobial Resistant Healthcare Associated Infection gave a new dimension to the a AMR issue and made Europe a leader in the field. Keeping in mind that AMR concerns everyone from low to high income countries. As I said previously, we are accountable to the younger generations for the measures and action we take now. We cannot afford to leave the next generation a world with uncontrolled antimicrobial resistance. We have to take off this burden from their shoulders. It is possible when all key actors join forces as we have demonstrated within the UJAMRI. Working hand in hand will allow to maximize our resources and improve our impact. Together, we will move forward further and faster to achieve our share objectives. Thank you. And Mariel, I'll give you the floor. Thank you very much, Professor Croy. And I'm very pleased to give the floor to Charles Price for the closing remarks from the DG Sante at the European Commission. Mr. Price, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marielle. And thank you to everybody who's here today on the call. 
and who's witnessed, I think, what's been the amazing achievements of the EU Jamrai. And they've been summarised excellently just now by Celine Pulsini. But also the inspiring commitments for the future uh, that we just heard from Marie-Cécile Ploie. So I really would like participants to go away with those inspiring words from Cecile, Marie Cecile and Celine, rather than to listen to very much uh, from me, from the European Commission. But I did want to just share with you a couple of thoughts. So I'm gonna attempt to share my screen now. and take you back to this picture. I've shared the white book. I shared the presentation. Okay, let's try again. How's that? Some of you may recognize this picture. It was taken on the 30th of September 2016 in Luxembourg. Okay, let's try one more time. This is wonderful, this is working. Oh, there we go. Perfect, thank so, you. Third time lucky. Um, so some of you may remember this, some of you may not may wish to even forget it. It was taken on the 30th of September 2016 in Luxembourg and it's the preparatory meeting for EU Jamrai. And you can't of course see the notice board there but I took a copy for you and it's a very busy slide as you can see and I think what it serves to remind us is that there was an enormous amount of work there was an enormous amount of work which took place right at the beginning which generated words which generated numbers which generated commitments which generated ideas and that now, four and a half years later, we've, through your efforts, through the enormous commitment that you've shown and through the skills and expertise that you've brought to Jamrai, you've turned words and ideas and commitments to concrete action. So on behalf of the European Commission, I want to say thank you. Thank you, EU Jam Rai. Thank you for delivering the amazing things that you've delivered. I think we're back now on the, uh, the chat. But Mary Cecile mentioned, I think, uh, about value for money. And I certainly agree with you, Mary Cecile, that for me, Jamrai's delivered value for money. We invested, the Commission invested, citizens' money, four million euros of citizens' money, and your member states invested another nearly three million in this. And that for us in the Commission that represented about a third of the whole budget for the public health action on AMR in the last seven years. So there was a lot riding on our investment. 
And I think for me, what you've demonstrated over the last three and a half years, but more what you've demonstrated in the last two days now, is how much was achieved by actually so little money. Because if you see how much money that was per EU citizen, it's about one and a half cents per person. Uh, one and a half cents, folks. The average expenditure on health care for an EU citizen is over 2,000 euros a year. A lot of that goes on treating infections. A big chunk goes on the use of antibiotics. And what you've demonstrated is that with a very small amount of money and your skill and energy, you've been able to mobilize action at member state level, at local level, in people's minds and achieve results. And you've left us also with a legacy of tools, ideas and challenges to take forward. And may I say about that legacy, I've worked at the Commission now for nearly 16 years and I've worked on a lot of projects. But I've never seen a project take so seriously the requirement that the Commission puts on the beneficiaries to plan and commit to sustainability and dissemination and the future. So I would like to give us very special thanks to all the partners, but particularly to France, to INSERM, for your commitment to that, which I think you started right at the beginning and still carries on. Now, the European Court of Auditors, of course, are the people who really judge value for money. And they looked at JAMRAI briefly when they reviewed the EU action on AMR, and they said, we found that the EU funded joint action on antimicrobial resistance JAMRAI facilitated co cooperation between member states. But ja JAMRAI's overall success will depend on actions subsequently taken by member states to actually implement the solutions developed by the work packages. And I think, though they mentioned, of course, the action by member states, clearly those actions are also, and those responsibilities are also by the EU institutions and by the Commission. We take very seriously your request to us. We take very seriously what you've asked for in terms of the follow-up actions. And we look forward to working together with you to really make the outputs of, joint, of, the joint, of EU JAMRA count in the months and years ahead for the benefit of the EU citizens, for their health, for the benefit actually also of the, of the animals and the agriculture in the EU. And that because we're talking also about the future and the need to include the environment in that, let's not forget that what we're talking about here is the sustainable use and the efficient use of our resources, which is a fundamental part of our overall sustainability agenda. So I think there's a lot of work more to be done and there's an even bigger picture to be addressed with this. And we look forward to working with you partners uh, on that agenda in the years to come. Thank you. Many thanks for this very uh, hopeful note. Thank you very much. The final conference is coming to an end. So now before I hand over to Professor Croix for the acknowledgement, thank you again for being with us today. Take care and stay safe.
Thank you so much, Charles, for your kind words. I'm deeply moved by your words and thank you for sharing this picture. I remember very well this meeting in 2016 and it, I was very impressed. It was the first time I coordinate such a huge action and uh, my first joint action. And uh, thank you so much for, for uh, reminding uh, this moment. And um, I'm also deeply moved because this is also the end of this uh, huge jam wine. I, I was very pleased to work with you all. I am very proud to have had the chance to coordinate such a wonderful team. And dear you jam wine partners, I would like to commend you because you're demonstrating that working hard together at the European level in a trustful and frank atmosphere, listening each other you showed that it was possible. Opening the way to addressing the unmet needs we did not have time to address in three years. During the last three years, we worked as a team, despite distance, despite the COVID pandemic where we were all engaged in. And now I can say that we are like a family. We know each other, we trust one another. Everyone is committed for the success of all the team. A warm thank you to the War Package leaders for their trust and their full commitment. And I really hope we, have, we will have other opportunities to work together. Thank you, the Joint Action Team, for fostering the synergies to align the barriers and opportunities to tackle AMR and for having presented the concrete actions. We have to continue uh, to collectively sustain the UJAMRI strategy. I want to give a special thanks to Sadika Bernard, the UJAMRI project manager I closely work uh, within the, these three years. Thank you for your commitment, your energy, for having assisted in every partner. Thank you to my colleague from the French Ministry of Health, the past and present ones, Christian, Jean-Baptiste, Anna, Céline, Jérôme, and Mariam. It was a fantastic adventure, and I thank you for the friendly discussions and advice. Obviously, I do not forget the European and international organization that you Jamrai partners have liaised with, and all countries involved in the you Jamrai. I thank you. We cannot do anything without you. Your continued commitment is key to success. And I'm, I am impatient to continue this wonderful work with all of you. And I would like to thank you, all the attendees, um, for this huge MY final conference, which was really successful. And I wish you a very good day. And you can see all the other pictures from the different General Assembly and the different events. So thank you to all of you. Thank you, thank you, Charles, and I also thank you, Yogita, for your continuous support during these three years. And I wish you all a very good day.